morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is Frick Els, and I'm editor of Biting.com, as you heard. We, um, we attract some 320,000 uh, unique visitors each and every month, and we also send out 200,000 uh, daily email newsletters. And more than 1.2 million pages are viewed on mining.com each and every month. Frick is short for Frederick, if you were wondering. And you can find me on Twitter, and that's at Frick Else. So here's the freaking presentation. <laughs> I'll come back to Mr. Getty's words towards the end of the presentation. I do believe um, those words might not ring so true anymore. Those were, were spoken 75 years ago. In order to size up the super cycle, I'll start off with a look at how we got to this point before I venture what the future may hold. While the super cycle concept was first described in the 1930s, it was only fairly recently that uh, the term became part of the popular lexicon. More than a decade ago, with the rise of the BRIC nations, and particularly China, journalists, analysts, and economists were looking for a word to describe the shifting ground beneath us. Today, people are asking, is anyone on the super cycle still peddling? Is China 3.0 heading for a hard landing? And if India, Brazil, or Africa can take up some of the slack? In this presentation, I'll discuss changes in China, and in the inimitable words of George W. Bush, I'll try to clear up some of the misunderstandings about China and its role in global mining. I'll also look at some of the other forces shaping the mining world, pricing volatility, volatility paper markets, the financialization of commodities, social media and the role of non-traditional mining players, the changing global risk profile, and the growing impact of transparency initiatives. I'll also I'll end with a, a look at a few trends to 2020 and beyond, and those will be good for the discussion afterwards. The short definition of a super cycle is a decades-long above-trend movement across a range of base materials. As you can see, I Googled it and got quite a few results. I looked at three long-term studies in the end, one by the United Nations, one by the Simon Fraser University, and one by the Economist Intelligence Unit. These studies represent some eight trillion worth of production in today's money. They all begin in 1850, when the Industrial Revolution was just kicking into full gear. Given the time span involved, it is not surprising that the studies differ on many details. But it may not really matter if we are at the beginning of the end of the super cycle or the end of the beginning, because the studies do agree on one thing. We are in the right industry. On these long-term time horizons, metals and minerals show an appreciation in real prices. Aluminum and bauxite are the exceptions. But agricultural products have been in perpetual decline since 1850. This may be hard to believe, considering what, your, what a shock your monthly grocery bill can still deliver. But on the whole, Growing things is valued less in the marketplace than digging things up. That's not to say that the metals and minerals are a one-way bet. For instance, if you put your money in tin in 1961, by 1978 you would have doubled your money. But holding on to it for another 18 years, in real terms, you'd be back to zero profit. This graph shows just how far prices can stray from the mean before they start to correct. Put another way, 
the market can stay irrational for much longer than you can stay solvent. Prices are now only back to where they were in the 1970s, and they are still below what they were for most of the first half of the 20th century. After the 2008 financial crisis that sparked the Great Recession, commodity pr prices bounced back surprisingly quickly. The reason for that is mainly because the value placed on metals and minerals are still in the midst of a long-term process of reverting to the mean. Since the bursting of the subprime lending bubble, economists, analysts, and the media, particularly those who were oblivious pre-Lehman Brothers, and that's most of us, have been falling over themselves to find asset bubbles wherever they can find them. The studies I looked at were surprisingly uniform in their conclusion that the current super cycle, starting at, at around the turn of the century, is a special case. Mining is not in a bubble. When a three-bedroom house, a stone's throw, and within earshot of a busy coal terminal costs $850,000, that's a bubble. If I sound bitter, that's because I live in Vancouver, BC, where real estate is priced as if 2008 never happened. The recent appreciation of real commodity prices simply represent a recovery from the multi-year and in some instances multi-decade lows around the year 2000. Within long-term super cycles, there are also periods of mini booms and busts. And the studies show these mini booms and busts are becoming more intense with wild swings in prices up and down something that anyone who's been living through the last 10 years in mining can surely attest to. I don't have to remind you that mining is currently in a downhill slope, although I just did. At the moment, the market is characterized by oversupply, declining prices, capex and output cuts, and inventory drawdowns. Some metals entered the down phase earlier than others. There is an upside, and that's FIFO. First in usually means first out. Long-suffering nickel miners received a shot in the arm from Indonesia's ore ban in January. And after years of painful market adjustment, tin and lead are showing signs of life again. And as Bill and Bob from Doran showed yesterday, there's still good money to be made from the four-letter metal. Now that, now that we have a handle on prices, how prices have changed over the last 164 years, let's look at how they may be set in the future. I just need to get some water. I forgot my water. And these, are, these guys are supposed to be the smartest people in finance. But unlike Yellen and Bernanke, anyone who doesn't know how the gold market operates may soon find out the hard way. I'm not talking here about the interminable arguments about the gold standard or whether Fort Knox is really bare or the conspiracy theories about market manipulation and high frequency trading. I'm referring here to what I call the financialization of metals and minerals. I chose the admittedly ugly word financialization because derivativization is absolutely impossible to say more than once. The gold market, as it operates today, is proof why paper always beats rock. In 2011, the London Bullion Market Association did a survey of its members that, have, that surprised even those bullion banks who've been fixing the price since 1919.
the survey found annual trading volumes amounted to 50 billion ounces. That's 600 times annual global output and many times the gold, the gold tons that has ever been mined. This chart shows just how liquid and leveraged the gold market has become. With $250 billion traded each and every day. That's more than the S&P 500 and the Dow Jones combined. The paper market in gold has become an untamable beast and its price distorting power is spreading to other metals and minerals. The current super cycle hasn't only impacted absolute price levels, perhaps more consequentially, how prices are set. In short, Wall Street's taking over, and the banks, investment firms, hedge funds, and broker dealers can outspend anyone, including China. And smooth operators like this guy can in nanoseconds execute trades that will have consequences at ground level on mines for years. The first gold derivative was launched at the end of 1974. What is astonishing is how long it took the smart money and the smart money algorithms to grab hold of other metals and minerals without getting their hands dirty. The most iconic future, the one that built the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, was Pork Bellies, which launched in 1961. It took almost 50 years for iron ore to catch up to frozen bacon. Iron ore, no, oh, next slide. Iron ore does not even feature on this graph. But now, New York, Dalian, and Singapore is quickly making up for lost time. From a standing start in 2008, iron ore futures volume will this year create parity with the 1.3 billion ton seaborne iron ore trade. During last Monday's mini crash, records were broken and the equivalent of 30 ore carriers were traded in futures in a single day. With hedge funds piling in and the use of, uh, in China of ore stockpiles as collateral for loans, as has been the practice in copper for a very long time, there's no reason to believe that iron ore, which after all is the second most traded commodity after crude oil, will not follow gold's lead. That's not to say that individual commodities matter to Wall Street. They tend to invest across the board ostensibly for the sake of diversification. That's why during the 2008 crash, the prices of completely unrelated metals, com completely unrelated commodities with widely diverging fundamentals, anything from cotton to copper, from milk to molybdenum, all fell in unison. Apart from derivatives, another way soft money is shaping hard assets and, move, and shifting pricing mechanisms away from miners to speculators is of course exchange traded products or ETFs. Since the first gold ETF was launched in Sydney in 2003, the number has grown to 150. After silver and platinum, palladium will soon sport an ETF. And against the protest of the large consumers, a number of merchant banks are now readying physical copper-backed ETFs. Already the likes of Goldman Sachs have signed mine offtake agreements for delivery into these copper funds. If you add to the mix the notoriously manipulated global copper warehouse system with its talk of dark inventory, eye-gouging physical delivery premiums, even during GLATS, and the use of copper as collateral, 
And this statement may not seem that over the top anymore. In theory, of course, a copper-backed ETF creates fresh demand for the underlying metal and should push up prices. But like futures traders, ETF investors are a fickle bunch. This graph shows just how good friends of the gold bucks ETF investors were, until they weren't. One of my best read stories ever on mining.com was in April last year after gold's $200 fall in the space of just two trading sessions. The headline was, chart of gold ETF tons shows crash was inevitable. I'm predicting that sometime in the future, I would be able to write a similar headline for copper, or palladium, or bismuth. And bismuth brings me to my next topic, the role of China. I'll come back to bismuth later, but I think I need to explain uh, the headline, the heading of this slide. Where I grew up, calling someone my China meant calling someone your friend or your mate. Go for the gap, my China, was, a, was the chorus of a popular song relating to rugby or cricket, if, I, if memory serves. China has indeed been our China. China has indeed been our friend for anyone in the resources business. The speed and scale of China's transformation to the preeminent force in commodities trading is unprecedented. China accounts for 70% of the iron ore trade, 50% of nickel, 42% of copper. The list goes on. However, China, China's economy is changing fundamentally. The new leadership is moving it away from, a, from an investment-driven economy to a consumption-led one. Chinese corporations have $427 billion in debt and interest due this year alone. So do you want the good news or the bad news about China first? The good news, the good news is two weeks ago, for the first time in its history, China suffered a corporate bond default. The bad news is, Two weeks ago, for the first time in history, China suffered a corporate bond default. There is a certain irony to the, that the collapse came in solar power and not the environmentalists' most hated industries of steel making and coal. But they are coming. With so few investment options outside property, Many Chinese have been investing in metals on a wing and a prayer, which I guess is the message this woman snapped in Hong Kong is uh, sending with her golden sandals. The 2010 China Credit, Credit Equals Gold number one collective trust product, to give it its full name, was backed by the world's largest bank and is part of the country's vast shadow banking system. It went sour because it lent money to a coal miner. It was bailed out at the last moment in February. But now, with the demise of the solar company, the precedent for de defaults have certainly been set. I called it bad news because it shows the tension in China between economic growth and debt as past breaking point. I call it good news because it shows the leadership in China have realized that the only way forward is to let market forces take over. And if China is, con is to continue to be our China, going forward, that's the only way it will happen. So much for Chinese opera. 
stats like these show just what a central role mining plays in China. But with headlines now screaming bust, where they used to shout boom, guilty as charged, some perspective is needed. China's GDP growth is both a national and an international obsession. The consensus forecast is of below 7.5% nominal growth this year, which would be the slowest pace since 1990. Growth slowing to a 24-year low sounds alarming at first blush, but let's put this another way. In absolute terms, in absolute terms, China would be adding $700 billion to its economy this year. That's excluding Hong Kong. That's greater than the size of the entire mainland economy in 1994, when growth rates peaked at 30%. $700 billion is also bigger than the entire Swiss economy, and that's worth two South Africans and four New Zealands. You'd think that working with raw materials, looking at absolute numbers would be the way to go. But that's not what the likes of CNBC and Bloomberg are feeding investors. And that's why the resource investor herd is running scared. Now that I've showed that China really is bigger and better, I'd like to debunk that straight away. A number of studies have shown that China's influence on commodities is less than commonly believed. The theory goes like this. Even though Chinese imports' share of global trade is high, its share of global trade is only a small portion of global production and consumption. Take coal, for instance. China burns almost 50% of the planet's coal. Those are eye-watering numbers indeed. But Chinese imports constitute less than 15% of global trade, which is itself a fraction of global production and consumption. And given all, almost all of this coal is produced in Zhuan and consumed in Zhuan, the idea that China plays a huge role in, in the international dollar price of coal including coke and coal, warrants closer scrutiny. China is not outbidding buyers in other countries for their commodities. In many instances, China is adding to supply, which should in fact drive down prices. Even in the iron ore market, which is in many ways a special case, as Sandy's presentation yesterday showed, China's impressive share of the seaborne trade is still 66% of 30% of world production. This chart, it's an IMF study, shows that the US economy is still the 800 pound gorilla in the metals and mining market. And, and though considerable, China does not punch above its weight. Not only does China not push up prices to the extent that is commonly believed, Chinese imports of commodities and swings in prices are not that closely correlated. Perhaps it's time again to pay closer to attention to Japan. If you look at the graph, its imports of ore and metals cl relates much closer to the price of iron ore, of metals and ore. To sum up, when it comes to China, when it comes to mining, China is our China. China is our friend. But it's not our only friend. As a journalist, I'll propose what I think are the top eight trends to 2020 and beyond in the form of news headlines. Number eight was copper ETF outflow shows crash was inevitable something I've already discussed. Number seven. Sure, the internet is the home of the hyperbole, but, but I could almost have written this headline last year. Marches organized and broadcast via Twitter against Gabriel Resources Rocha Montana mine in Transylvania wasn't the only thing that sank the project. An overambitious mining plan and the vagaries of Romanian politics probably did most of the damage. But when your project needs public and political approval, 
you are doomed if you lose control of the social narrative. This guy was a stalwart of the protests, of the many months of protests, and he was no doubt spurred into action by the incendiary terms like cyanide lake that will now forever be linked to this doomed project. I am a bit skeptical about citizen journalism and the power of Twitter is often overstated. See the Egyptian revolution. But obtaining a social license is fast becoming as important as a mining one. Companies will be forced to spend as much time convincing the public of the viability and benefits of a mine as they currently do investors. The meek may not inherit the world's mineral, mineral rights, but the meek with a smartphone just might. Despite wars and instability, exploration money continues to pour into Africa. Almost two billion last year, which was more than Australia and Canada. A billion more still goes into Latin America, but Africa gives you better bang for your buck. In 2013, Africa boasted 40% of the significant drill results, defined as dollar value per meter across the two regions. Outside the Congo, an equivalent investment in exploration yielded almost double the number of significant fines than in Chile, Peru, and Brazil combined. And these numbers exclude ferrous, so add in iron ore in West Africa and oil and gas across the whole continent. And the shift of extractive industries to Africa begins to look irrefutable. And as you can see from this map, it's a pretty big place. Number five. In search of new deposits, mining must continue to push further into frontier markets, into the world's more unstable places and uncertain jurisdictions. Apart from many African countries, Turkmenistan, Myanmar, Papua New Guinea, Iran, Guatemala, Honduras, Turkey, Pakistan, are all opening up to investment, becoming investment friendlier, improve governance, and generally behave less like basket cases. Mongolia is a good example of how this process plays out. Ivano Mines and Rio Tinto's 2009 deal to develop the massive Oyotolgo copper gold mine set the stage for breakneck growth for the nation of fewer than three million people. Yes, holding on to licenses and permits is still dicey in Mongolia, as 166 exploration explorers caught up in a completely unrelated corruption scandal found out the hard way. Yes, expats can still be arbitrarily detained. Yes, Mongolian politics will be a hot mess for a long time to come. And only yesterday, Rio had to write down 800 million on Ayotolgoi. But when foreign investment faltered last year, cooler heads did prevail and actual laws changed. When people first taste the benefits of development, the desire not to squander those opportunities are strong. I picked Mongolia, but there is no reason the path taken by others would be all that different. Mining.com reported in December that an Australian explorer, no doubt with the blessing of brother leader Kim Jong-un, found the world's largest deposit of rare earths conveniently located 150 kilometers north of Pyongyang. The DPRK already exports rare metals to China. And China has only had limited success in draining in its own rare earth industry, which among a strong field of contenders must be one of the most unsafe and polluting industries in China. China also wants to have more leverage over the tin pot dictator. I know, anything emanating from North Korea should be viewed with a heavy dose of skepticism. 
But this headline is less than a comment on the roller coaster rare earth industry, than an example of how competition can emerge from absolutely anywhere. Number three. Human rights group Transparency International turned 20 last year. George Soros' Revenue Watch is 12 years old, and Global Witness 21. The number of NGO workers around the world absolutely dwarf the number of miners. Tech firms like Intel and Apple are making a virtue of abiding by conflict mineral rules. NGO lawsuits are inspiring local communities to file court cases in Europe, America, and in Canada. The world's largest refinery only last week was caught doling out $5 billion in cold, hard cash that would have found their way into African warlords' pockets. And I have to be careful what I say here. I do not want any of those nasty lawyers' letters anymore. But the Benny Steinmetz, Guinea, Simondar case will lead to more guilty pleas and set many legal precedents, all of which is great news for ethical, transparent, and social, socially responsible companies like yours. I've been racked over the knuckles for calling it a cartel, so I'll mm -hmm. cease and desist. When Ural Kali's CEO blew apart the cozy cross-country setup in Potash, it looked as if Potash miners would have to start operating like everybody else. While most other metals and minerals have been exposed to the ravages of open markets and hot money, potash producers have managed to keep intact an early 20th century type of doing business. Given its price elasticity, how quickly the price reacts to changes in demand, controlling supply may be the only way to make good money in fertilizer. I'm sure that crossed Vladimir Baumgart in his mind many times while he was languishing in a Minsk jail. But Vladimir Putin knocked together a few oligarch heads and now things are going back to normal in Potash. Well, what counts for normal in Potash? And this makes Potash the exception that proves the rule when it comes to the financialization of commodities. I promised I'd come back to bismuth. The Fanya Metal Exchange in Kunming, China, trades antimony, germanium, gallium, indium, and bismuth. Bismuth is a lead replacement and also widely used in the cosmetics industry. From total obscurity a few years ago, Fanya is now the dominant player. It has managed to stockpile three times annual global production of indium and it's doing the same for bismuth. After going nowhere for a very long time, bismuth prices have leapt. I admit, few miners give bismuth a second thought, and Fania is not exactly Wall Street. But the exchange has now opened in the Singapore, in the Shanghai free trade zone. And if silver can be cornered by two brothers, who knows what Fania can do? I end with the bismuth story because it is an amalgamation of the trends and the issues that I try to tackle in this presentation. It speaks to the rise of China. It shows how broker dealers are taking over the mining world and resting control over price setting. And it also shows that super cycles in metals and minerals can be triggered in very different ways. And it also gives me an excuse to put up a picture of a fashion model in a mining presentation. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>